the battle against global poverty is a dynamic, complex, David versus Goliath struggle. But throughout the course of that struggle, Dr. Jeffrey Sachs is the closest thing that we've had to a true North. So let's give him one more round of applause. There isn't a lot of certainty in the battle against global inequality and global poverty. But one thing that is for certain is that the current generation of leaders, the current institutions, the current global leadership and the current thought leaders, even Dr. Sachs, are not going to win this battle. They're not going to win this fight. The genius of what Sam and Noreen and some of the other people have put together today is that they understand that that fight can only be won by those in the audience today, the next generation of leaders. So with that in mind, I want to introduce our next speaker who really understands the importance of what this room is going to bring to the fight over the course of the next several generations. So please welcome the co-chair of the Millennium, Millennium Campus Conference, Noreen Leahy. against women and oppression of women can hold entire communities back. Our next speaker understands this reality and has dedicated her work towards changing it. She speaks with unapologetic passion about the importance of youth empowerment and gender equality. Her leadership in the Women of Liberia Mass Action for Peace played a pivotal role in ending Liberia's civil war in 2003 by bringing together Christian and Muslim women in a non-violent movement. She leads the Bowie Peace Foundation Africa, the Liberia Reconciliation Initiative, and Peace Security Network Africa. She is also the author of the recent book, Mighty Be Our Powers. And if all of this wasn't enough, she is the proud mother of six children. Please join me in welcoming the 2011 Nobel Peace Laureate, Layla Bowie. to my assistant Hafiza, who's in Liberia, but who said, Madam Bowie, this is what you stand for, and I think you should go. <laughs> it's truly an honor for me to be back in Boston after many years, three years since we received the Kennedy Award three years ago as Liberian women. This is truly an honor. When I was asked to come and speak for 15 minutes, I struggled with what do I come and say to 1,200 young people and some adults who came to see or to spy as we do more young people. <laughs> <laughs> but it was important for me to be here because since receiving the Nobel Peace Prize and receiving it at a not so very old age, I feel there's an enormous challenge for me to continue to do the work that I do. But also as a local girl with a global platform now to bring a lot of young people along as I spread the message of peace, women's rights, and equality. Several months ago, I went to Dallas, Texas to meet with some very influential women 
And some of them thought to bring their daughters along to sit and have this conversation with me. The young woman said to me, Madam Bowie, I'm sure when you come to the U.S., you are fascinated by the big buildings you see. And I said to her, no. <laughs> when I come to the U.S., I don't look at big buildings. I look beneath big buildings. I look for homeless people and single mothers with children who have nowhere to go. That's what I look for. Because as I look around in those communities for the issues of inequality, it gave me a sense of being, a purpose of being there at that moment. So that's what I look for. Whether she understood or not, I don't know. <laughs> but she didn't ask me anything. <laughs> Three days ago, I found myself in New Orleans speaking at a big conference. And as part of my request, as I go to speak with big, at big conferences, please make time for me to go into the communities to interact with young people. So they took me to a school in New Orleans. Students and children in that school are from the ninth ward. And they have 90% of, yeah, 90% black and 1%, but 10, or 99% black, 1% white. But the teachers, <coughs> I observe are predominantly white people. I went there very excited that they had, some of them had studied about the Nobel Peace Prize and they were anxious to see me. Of course, they were between the ages of 6 to 10 and 12. So I got in the room with the first group and we started, I asked them to ask me questions talking about Liberia. And the first question that I got do your people live in house? And I said, yes. What food do your people eat? I answered. The second class came, do your people live in house? By that time, my West Africanness was coming out. <laughs> I was losing my patience. So by the time we got to the fifth graders and the first person that raised their hand said, what food do your people eat? I said, for the record, I live in a house. I don't live in trees. We don't have tigers running in our backyards. So people own iPhones. And every time I was saying that, they went, I thought about 
a lot of things. And the first thing that came to my mind was the huge responsibility that your generation have in dealing with these issues. And the question I kept asking myself, how prepared are these young people to tackle the issues? How prepared are we making them to tackle the mess that we're making of this world? How prepared are they to take on the enormous challenges of global leadership, sustainable development, peace and security, and job security for the 400 million young people that is estimated to be in Africa by 2045? I kept asking myself, and that's the question I have for you young people in this room, eager to be at the Millennium Campus Conference, how prepared are you? I've heard several phrases, and I know we have a Liberian delegation here. There is a big political discussion now, generational change. And in April, I was in South Africa, and they said the youth there say generational integration. And the question we keep asking, as the not so old and the not so young, how do this generational change take place? How accountable and responsible are you young people when you step into the shoes? Because what we're leaving back, or what the, the, the politics of our world is leaving back for you to inherit. For those of you who come from Africa, I feel sorry for you. Corruption, nepotism, militarism, Big outlook, a shrinking middle class, and maybe by the time the generational change takes place, there will be poor people and rich people and no middle ground. How prepared are you? How prepared are you to stand up for the rights of women when you take over this leadership that we're all preparing you for and you're preparing yourself for? How prepared are you to allow, as you're now asking us, Allow us to speak about our issues. How prepared are you when you're presidents and prime ministers and finance ministers to call women and say, help us to structure a budget for your reproductive rights and health? How prepared are you? How prepared are you now, even as a student, to move beyond your classroom and say to yourself, I'm not getting enough knowledge. <laughs> I want to go into the inner city in Boston and see how poverty or what poverty looks like. How prepared are you? You have a huge tax ahead of you. By the time you get to that place, the line for the Nobel Prize is going to be so long. <laughs> because there will be so many of you qualified and overly qualified. But what will be important, I think, will not be the level of qualification that you bring to the job, but your commitment to the people that you work for and your passion for what you do. I had the opportunity of sitting with the Archbishop Desmond Tutu at the um, Davos Conference in February, and I had pen and paper Everything he said, I wrote. <laughs> and then he said to me, you're an eager student. And I said, Bishop, there will be some time, I think, in my lifetime, that I may not find someone like you to speak to me the way you are speaking. Because if you look across our different countries, the voice of reasoning in our countries are shrinking. The moral voices in our different countries are shrinking on a daily basis because people are now seeing life, the world, youth, leadership, and all of these different things as about sides and not about the issues. 
So I want to write down everything you're telling me because tomorrow I want to reflect on these things probably when you are not around anymore. I did not come here to make you cheer and yell. I came here to tell you about the reality of the world that you live in. And the world that you live in today, the world that we all live in today, Dr. Sachs talked about some of the challenges in Africa. Other speakers have come to encourage you to say you have to do this. It's not really out there. It's tough. But you know something? I know that each and every one of you young people in this room have some light in you that can help you tackle a problem. He talked about reaching out to teach children to read. As I stood in that school in New Orleans, I told myself there is work to be done. Children, where am I from? Africa. Which part of Africa am I from? Me, Miss Bowie? Yes, sweetie, Texas. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Which part of Africa am I from? Louisiana. Thank you. I saw one of the teachers cover his face with his shirt. <laughs> There's more to be done. Sustainable development starts from whom? <coughs> I'm sorry, I know that many people will not want to clap. I didn't win the prize by making peace in the US. And this young man is standing on my car. 
And he was shocked that the entire time, no one came close to that car. And then he asked him, every time you come, every way you see this car, you come, he said, because this is not your car, it's my boss lady, this car. <laughs> Where's my boss lady? He said, she's going on vacation. Are you sure I hope you didn't steal this car? I came back in February. We had another event who was there. I turned to him and said, you know something? I'm sick and tired of you following me around and begging me for money. Come to my office on Monday. And my office is, he said, oh, I know that. I even know your house. <laughs> he came to my office on Monday and we have a group of young girls working with us. And this one, very American assistant. I walk him into the office, he's very dirty, bloodshot eye, and said to them, ladies, this is our new security guard. And everyone went there. <laughs> the first day I hear him, okay, so I turn him over to them and travel that night. So it's like, he's your problem. <laughs> And yet the first day he went to work, after two hours he went to Afiza, my assistant, and said, it's time to go home. And she looked at her time and said, you've been here for two hours. We're in September. He's the last person to leave the office every day. I've never seen him with a bloodshot eye for a long time. He dresses well. In the office, he sits during lunchtime and learns the alphabet. He's proud that he can now sign his name when he goes to the bank to get his salary. One of my favorite moments was him coming to me and saying, I need 20 bucks. And I said to him, I thought you were told now that you work for money, you can no longer beg. <laughs> and he looked at me and smiled and said, look at you. Who told you I was begging you? I want credit. <laughs> when I took pay at the end of the month, I would give you your twenty dollars. I'm not a beggar. I'm a working man. <laughs> I look at that young man every day, and some of the young women that have benefited from our scholarships and tell myself, if each and every one of us could just commit to one person who we'll ease the burden on the world. Young leaders, what is your commitment? Is it to go out to a local school and teach a child to read? Is it to see a foreign student who seemed totally lost at Northeastern, and instead of calling him a geek, befriending him and showing him some of the way. Because trust me, you may achieve many great things in your professional life, but those everyday moments are the ones that count. Think about it. Thank you.